Welcome to Kicking It Local. I'm Johnny Kecko, and this is a podcast all about the football community in South Australia. And I chat with players, coaches, officials, anyone in between. And today I'm joined by Jonathan Negus for part two of our chat. And if you didn't miss part one, make sure you go back and listen now. Or if you did listen, here's a quick refresher. I was always the first player picked, but the last one to be put in a spot. It's a gift and a curse. Yeah. It's like if you're a versatile player, it's great because you can, you're great for that team you're in. Yeah. It's no good for you personally because who else is going to want you? You were under Damien Murray, like as you just mentioned, ex um, played in the NSL, but also has proven to be a very good coach as well. Has he been... Uh, any inspiration to you as a coach yourself now? I think in a lot of ways, a lot of the things that I take out to training sessions of the game come from him. Yeah. A lot of the things that he got came from Zoran Matic. That same mm. goes for Carl. That same goes for Joe Mullen. I think they all fell from that one tree. Jonathan Negus, mate, thank you for joining me for part two of your interview. I'm back, baby. Mate, it's, uh, it's one episode that I had to split in two because you have so much to talk about. You've been in the game for a very long time, 20 years You've played over 400 games and you're still playing today as you're a coach for Modbury Vista and also a player as well. So you're doing it all, but we've got heaps to get through. We didn't have time to talk about the uh, the FFA Cup, but today I want to chat about your experiences so far. The good, the bad, the ugly. We're going to talk about the uh, your coaching a little bit later on as well, but also the injuries you've gone through because you, off air you told me some horrific uh, incidences you've been involved in. But the, the really good part that I want to get involved in is the FFA Cup. It's a huge thing in South in Australia to be able to play in the FFA Cup. South Australia at the beginning only had one uh, local spot in the, uh, the round of 32 onwards. Now we've gone to two, but you've managed to appear in it a couple of times now uh, with Metro Stars. But the very first time that you could have appeared would have been with Adelaide City in the very first edition of the FFA Cup. What was it like for you? Because you just left... <laughs> just full, just full of hammy. Cramped, you, yeah, cramped. Cramped. Got a cramp. We're good. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that, that, um, we'll talk about the. Yeah. <laughs> that would go into so part and parcel, mate. It's part and parcel of the gig now. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's how. Um, that's what happens when you play 400 games <laughs> in your local leagues and still play a coach. Hey, um, um, so you're you left Adelaide City um, in 2013 part of that team for a very long time and you just missed out on going to the FFA Cup with them. What was it like for yourself missing out on that opportunity? I mean, it, yeah, it was a bit of, bit of pill to swallow because we had been so good for so long and there wasn't an opportunity to play at that sort of competition. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was there watching the game. I was on the hill. I had my city scarf on. Um, having a good time, and I was I was super I was so wrapped for the boys. Yeah. Um, to get the result and just be a part of something like that. Um, yeah. It it, it was unfortunate, but it, for me personally, but that doesn't matter. It mm. was for the club and for the team and that group. That was that was awesome. And the that game there because I remember it vividly. It was a great a night, not just for Adelaide City, but for South Australia, being able to have a club like them playing in. The, an, a truly national competition because we haven't had that in a very long time a, a, a cup like the FFA Cup which is now called the Australia Cup so that night there there was oh, thousands of people down in Marden mm-hmm. and the atmosphere was incredible yeah. and when Thomas Love scored that goal that was um, absolutely amazing what was it like for you being in the stands watching that game? Yeah it was great um, I was stood with a bunch of people from all different clubs and people put their allegiances aside yeah. for South Australian football yeah. on that night and everyone wanted City to get up and City are not a you know a well supported side at local level which is surprising but a game like um, the FFA Cup that would truly have an impact on um, the local teams as well being able to get that um, uh, the all the eyes on them because now it's on 10 play with the network 10 yeah so it's now visible to a lot larger community than what it was previously yeah so for though, and even the grand final now is on prime time um, on television on the commercial television as well. So that competition, what has it done for the local the local leagues in your point of view? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the idea that you could get yourself on Football Manager by yep. playing in the FFA <laughs> Cup, <laughs> yeah. like that's a big that's a carrot. You know, yeah. you should be chasing that. Um, I mean, outside of that, you, you just play to win everything you can win. Yeah. So the exposure is great. If you've got aspirations to play at the next level, obviously that's another channel. Yep. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it's just a it's a great competition. I I love it. Absolutely. And um, now we talked about you being off the field watching at a, a former club in the competition, but you got your chance to play with Metro Stars. They um they uh, had a great appearance in the FFA Cup. You scored a goal in the FFA Cup against Blacktown. What was it like scoring in not let alone playing in the uh, national comp, but scoring? That was incredible. Um, I'll backtrack a little bit. I was at Cumberland, playing for Cumberland State League One. I got injured in round one and I was out for ten weeks, and then I got a call from Robbie Saracino. He was the uh, assistant coach at the time. Yeah, Michael Peroni was a coach. Neeks, do you want to come play for us? I went, yeah, right. That was the conversation, honestly. It just went, yep, I'm coming. Because he was like, we've got the FFA Cup coming up. You could play in that. I went, yeah, done. Yep. <laughs> Within a week, I'm at Metro. Um, Within a week, I've scored two goals for Metro. I'm feeling good. Um, We get to go to Sydney to play Blacktown. This team was heavily favoured. They were very strong. They'd had a number of... um only recently sort of released A-League players, yep. some that were still making their way up to the A-League. And we played 45 minutes of just hell where they just destroyed us. And and um, we were so we were down 1-0 at half time and it should have been five. Um, and then somehow in the second half, we managed to hold them out and then pull back one and then pull back another, get up 2-1. I think it was in like the 70th minute or something. And then we had a penalty to kill the game in the 90th and uh, Scotty Tunbridge kicked it down the street instead of in the goals. You should never have taken that, Scotty. It was Fabes' to take. Um, <laughs> Is that a bit controversial? That uh, Not <laughs> really. Like They were a little bit dirty on each other at the time, but I really think it should have been Fabes because he won the penalty. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like, I think that game so fondly, like just everything about that game, we... It, it was foggy. It was just, it was freezing cold. I think it was like four degrees. Um, no one expected anything of us. And which is surprising because the year before they were the NPL champions, like yep. the national champions. So no one really cared. No one thought we deserved anything. And they were giving us crap as we walked off. I'll go back to Adelaide. And we were like, yeah, we, that's that's what we're doing. <laughs> we couldn't get a drink afterwards because they had the, they got the curfew of like eleven o'clock. You can't get a drink or whatever. Like yep. you can't. All the bars are locked down that's or whatever. Ridiculous. Couldn't get a beer. So we've just won the biggest game basically the club had seen for ever, and we had Domino's and Coke, and that was it. Um, Jeez. On top of that, um, so I'm new to the club. I've just scored like one of the most important goals in the club, in the club's short or in the club's history. Um, I've got bad sinuses. Yeah. So when I fly, I take Sudafed. It clears me up. Yep. Otherwise, I get intense headaches. And then we get this list of drugs that you can and cannot take, right? <laughs> and I see Sudafed. Oh, no. And I'm freaking out, right? And I've just scored a goal. So afterwards, they're like, look, don't be surprised if someone comes to test you guys. And, he, and then the club's like, it might be you because, you know, you scored, whatever. But yeah. that's all right. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, oh, but I'm worried about it. I've just taken Sudafed. Okay, long story short, it's prescription Sudafed you're not allowed to take, not the over-counter the stuff that oh. I take. So <laughs> yeah. there's me freaking out. Like, we've just gone and done this and I'm the new guy who's come in and I've ruined it for everyone. But no, I've taken over-the-counter Sudafed. It's perfectly legal, guys. No problem. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> you would have been stressing out all night. Oh, it's so bad. And I had got us sleeping in the bed next to me, snoring his head off. And I was just, just stared at the ceiling the whole night, just freaking out. Like, what am I going to do? What am I going to tell people? <laughs> How long did it last until you realised that you're, you're it was clear? It was the next day when I actually went over the, the list with a fine tooth comb. And I was like, no, no, no. What I've taken is perfectly fine. It's just like normal stuff. Like What they're saying is you can't take is... is prescription, proper drugs, and I don't do that. So yep. it's all good. That is hilarious. Yeah. Well, there, there you go. So you had a great night. You scored a goal and you should have been celebrating if you were there worrying about what you Yeah, did. I was yeah. freaking out. And we were having pizza and Coke and we were in bed by about midnight, I think. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, there you go. That's a, When you see someone score in the FFA Cup, you're thinking they're out celebrating but not in that no, bed stressing their head off. I had a beer at 6 o'clock in the morning at the airport. Yeah. That was my celebration. So you can have a beer at 6 o'clock in the morning at the airport but not, not at 11 o'clock at night. No. But you went through all that. You've scored a, uh, an important goal in an important time at, an, at a club, um, for a club in their history. And... But during that period, not that period uh, specifically, but during the period of you playing over the last twenty years, you've had some great achievements. You've scored. You've uh, you've won so many cha- uh, championships in South Australia. 
You've played in the FFA Cup. You've won five cups. You've player of the year twice, but you've had a lot of injuries as well. What are some of the worst ones? Because you're telling me a little bit off air. You've broken your um, broken a few bones. Your arms. There you go. You're showing me right now. Your forearm. That's a scar. That's a metal plate in there. Jeez. Got a metal plate in this ankle. No metal plate in this one, but it's been broken. Yep, on your right ankle. I've got a scar. And this one's the best one. I've got a scar on my head here. Just above your uh, right yeah. eyebrow? Playing Campbelltown. I think it was 2008, And you remember it as well? Yeah, of course. You, yeah. This stuff you remember. I flicked on a ball towards goal from a corner, and it's going in. Um, Nick Boudin's come and running at me, like celebrating this goal that we've just scored as a certainty. And he's jumped up, and I'm still watching the ball. Ball sails wide. It's yeah. not a goal. But he's celebrating like it's a goal. And he's jumped on me, and his front tooth has broken off into my head. Jeez, where, where's that scar again? Can I see it? It's here somewhere. It's somewhere. Yeah, it's all right. All right. You I can think see I see something. Yeah. yeah. But he's he's he clonked me in the head. I'm bleeding everywhere. Yeah. Um, and then Buddha's looking around for his tooth, <laughs> and we're looking everywhere for the tooth. Can't find it. Later that night, I'm going to get stitches at the oh, hospital, no. <laughs> and they've got the tweezers out, and they've pulled out half a tooth. Oh, so you had the tooth in your head. Yeah, I had the tooth in my head, yeah. and then the next week, like my face looked like Quasimodo because I just got all infected, and it blew up. It just looked ridiculous. Did they end up saving his tooth, or no? He had, he had to go and get a crown. No, he had to go get a crown. Yep. Oh, jeez. So yeah, that's uh, that, he's still got that one. He's still, <laughs> but I've got the scar for it. Um, I wonder who came off better than no one. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it cost me less. I reckon it would have cost him a bit to get those front teeth fixed. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had broken ribs from playing against Mobby Jets. Um, I've had uh, uh, that was that was a two week stay in hospital. So I uh, got smashed by the goalkeeper uh, straight to hospital. Uh, so it was punctured lung. Three broken ribs. Jeez. And then my lung collapsed after two days. Um, and then three weeks later, I was playing in the cup final. Wow. Yeah. So you've been through the wars. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, yeah. So I've had dislocated oh. kneecap, dislocated ankle that ended up being broken. Um, the broken arm, obviously. That's um, But they're all impact injuries. I didn't start getting the soft tissue injuries until I was in my mid to late yep. 30s. But um, yeah, if I get injured, I do it well. Jeez, so that's, if, I, if I can't play, the coach knows something's probably wrong. Yeah, that that is. Oh, I don't know how you did that and yeah. still be able to play, uh, continue playing. Yeah, no, me either. Crazy. Yeah, and you did say a little bit off air as well that your mum wanted you to play soccer because it's not as uh, not seen as to be as uh, as full on as the uh, Aussie rules. Well, originally, as a five year old or whatever it was, they wanted. The reason I didn't go play footy is because I was too young. So I went and played soccer until I was old enough to play footy. I was okay at that age. Like I was, I was a bad player. So they yep. just kept going through. And then when I started playing footy, mum was like, you should play soccer. It's, it's non-contact. Yeah. You'll be all right. Yeah. I think the worst thing I ever got playing footy was a corky. Not scars all over my body and or surgery. And, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> tooth in your forehead. Yeah. That's, that's one that you won't forget. Yeah. I, um, but... Coming with the, the the bad stuff, unfortunately, happens with uh, the good stuff as well. But you've played a 20-year um, career, had a 20-year career. So, unfortunately, things like that are going to happen, but not as as much as uh, <laughs> as you've been through. But you're still playing today. You're, you finished your career, well, almost hung, you almost hung up your boots at the end of 2021 playing for Modbury Vista in your first season there to take up coaching. But... After playing, uh, after coaching um, for a few games at Modbury Vista, as we speak now, you had to put the boots back on to get on to the pitch. And when you did finish, you were at 98 goals for your career. You're now sitting on 99 after coming back, making a return as a player coach. Can you th- see yourself uh, getting over the cracking over the hundred? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the plan was always to be a player coach. Uh, when when I first took the role it was i'm just going to play every game i'm going to start every game i'm going to play every game and i can coach because it's just that easy Mm. that's foolish to think that that's a possibility um but that was just you know i was naive about it and i was yeah confident so that's not really it's not feasible to be that guy yeah um but the last couple of weeks like i i can't i haven't been able to train i've been training 20 other players so I'm now starting to get myself in a position where I'm trying to get a little bit fitter. I can come on for 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. I did 45 today. Um, 
so yeah, even if it means I just come on and take a penalty in the 90th minute, I'll get that 100th. Well, as we uh, as we record this, you're on 99, but by the time this episode gets out, you may have already scored the goal the previous week before it, it's uh, been released. But that's still a massive achievement. Can you see yourself getting to 500 now? Are you Are just getting closer and closer to the 450? I don't know. Um, Games, that is? I really don't know. Um, it's If you look at it in the sense of years, it's another three years mm. of playing to get there. Um, and that's three years of playing nearly every game. I don't think you'll see those guys anymore, those 500-game guys, because... Now we're all playing on artificial. It's really lots of players are really struggling to play on these on these surfaces. So, the the days of three four hundred game players, I think they're done at this level at least. Um, but I I suppose my body's conditioned to be treated not particularly well anyway. Yep. So if anyone's going to be able to go to five hundred from here, it'd probably be me. Yep. Yeah. Hey, hopefully that <laughs> that'll be good to see. Um, you get cracked that 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 five hundred yeah. milestone, which is um. Still, still a few years away. Like but it's not a goal. It's not no. something that I'm looking towards as, as, as you know, a, a box I need to tick. Yeah. I, I really don't. It doesn't worry me. But if a better player comes along, would you rather give up your spot as a player? Oh, 100%. Them? No, that's, that was the whole the whole idea was the, the club were very much wanted me playing. They wanted me on the field every week for whatever reason. You know, it would it'd be better for the young players, it'd be better for the people watching. It's just, just generally better and... And I've said from day one, if I can get someone to come and do the job that I'd be doing better, I'm not needed on the park. Yeah. And if I can get someone younger to come and do it, it's a double bonus. Has COVID played a part in you playing? A uh, little bit. Yeah, a little bit. We've had, I think with, like with every club, they're getting affected with I think this whole idea that five players need to be out for you to be out, have to postpone a game. Um, you know, we're having three out here and there and every I think every other club is it's like you know if you've got three key players out that is a difference between yeah, winning and losing at this level um, so yeah it's it's been a struggle we've just had to adjust mm. we, some weeks we're allowed to have a meal together some weeks we're not we, we try to be diligent with masks we try to be diligent with hand sanitizer and all those things but what do you do Mm. This is going down a path of a different conversation. So yes, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's hard with the the coaching and the 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 game today with COVID is a lot different to what it would have been two years ago with um with no COVID, where there's no restrictions, plays available every week unless they do something silly or injure themselves during mm. a game. So now you're dealing with a whole different thing. That it's out of their hands. They can't leave the house for seven days now. In, in for some instances, and it just creating a whole new challenge for coaches but it's not for coaches in general absolutely for me it's not new this is yeah. all i've known as a coach so when things are good and every when things hopefully go back to normal and 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 things are players are available every week depending on injuries or whatever but um then maybe then i won't know what to do but this at the moment well, like we get we handle it the way yeah. we do well this is your first time being a head coach but you had a little bit of experience as a coach during your playing days as well before coming to modbury vista at Playford. Yep. So under Ben Moore, you've helped him um, as an assistant coach while playing at the club. What was that like and how has that helped you as a coach now at Modbury? Oh, it was great because like he, he's one of my best mates in football and out, out of football. Um, the, the whole purpose of going there was to help him yep. more than anything else. Um, you know, as assistant role, like he was in charge. He was the boss. I just helped out, you know, wherever I could with whatever I could, um, given he's a goalkeeper. Um, my views on the game were always going to be a little bit different from his, but you know he was in charge. That wasn't a problem for me. Um, I, there, were, there were good things about it. There were. It was difficult to come and be a new player and assistant coach at the yeah. same time. That was there was some difficulty there, given that they'd just been promoted the year before, so they were sort of big on themselves in a certain way. Um, but doing it with Benny was it yeah. was great. Yeah. I hope he, to get him to come be my assistant next year. <laughs> he might come down from Saturday one Hopefully. season too. Or if you guys can get promoted. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? It's either way. But um, you um, having someone like that though, he's he's highly regarded as a coach because he was a very good player back in his day as well. But those we've got a we mentioned in the episode one about the the coaches that are doing very well now. They come from a different from another level from all the other coaches that have made their way over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Zora Matic and, and the likes that have gone, had, done, uh, had amazing careers as coaches. And now we're seeing the new generation come through. Do you reckon there's going to be another generation after you guys and just keep going that's going to be underneath you? I hope so. 
I mean, the the fundamental stuff that I've learned, I'm trying to pass on. The fundamental stuff that, that uh, you know, Damien, Joe Mullen, that they learned, they've passed on to us. There's always going to be slight tweaks. There's always going to be different, you know, thoughts on, on how the game's played, but it's a simple game. Mm. And, and if we try not to overcomplicate it, um, it's only for the better. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of the things we learned were mental as opposed to actual actually technical so trying to instill these mental aspects to the next generation can be difficult um but the players who pick it up they tend to to progress further and be better and um your player coach is not many of them that you see too often as a player coach so as you're um We've seen it in the FFA Cup where we've had XA league players that have gone played in local leagues and they've had to sub themselves on because they've um, they're they're down a couple of goals so they sub themselves on and it's great to see and they're playing against some A league clubs as well, but we don't see too many of that uh, of those players. Is it what's it like for yourself uh, being able to juggle those two without focusing like trying to focus on one? It's uh. It's, it- it's, it can be difficult, um, but I'm still learning. Mm. So I, I really don't know if I'm doing things badly or not. Uh, we we have results that don't go our way and you have to reflect on each game mm. individually and and say, well, the reason we lost this game is because perhaps today we just weren't as good as them because yeah. at that level, State League 2, there are going to be days where you're just not as good as the other team. Um, or was it a coaching thing? Or was it just a personnel thing? Um it, it, it's it's difficult to put your finger on mm. on why things go the way they do from week to week, given the, I suppose, the inconsistency of the players at that level, mm. because they're not MPL players. No, um, you know they they play stately two for a reason. Whether it's because they work too much and they don't want to train as much, or because they just want to have a kick with their friends, or whatever the reasons. Um, yeah, coaching for inconsistency is the biggest hurdle for me yeah um you're at you're at modern vista it's your second year first year as a coach what's the club like being uh involved at modern vista um what what's it been like coming to this uh this club it's been great um we've just got the new facilities opened up start of this year so we've got the new like they've had the new pitches for a little while uh artificial turf we've got the new club rooms now the big multi-story yeah it looks great um, and it's now, it's a, it's a hub. It's a hub in that mm. the Northern suburbs where people really should, you know, want to be, to yeah. play. Um, but it's about getting a, as a first team men's and women's in a position where it's enticing for young players and, and older players to want to come and be, you can have all of the facilities, you can have all the bells and whistles, but if you're not, if you're not successful, then no one will come. So that's where we are at the moment, where we're trying to build that. And Modbury is one of the few clubs that have a women's team in the WNPL. We've got um, a lot of clubs are starting to get teams into the uh, WSL as well, the Women's State League. Mm-hmm. But all the men's NPL teams don't have a WNPL side in that competition. Mm-hmm. But you've got um, a mixture. You've got Metro United, that a, a, a one-off uh, women's club. But you've also got teams from the State League 1 and State League 2 that have women's teams uh, in the WNPL as well. So Modbury Vista is one of those in uh, Men's State League 1 that has a WNPL. What's it like uh, being a part of a club, like, um, having those those uh, opportunities for both the men and the women? I mean, it's great for the club. It's great for the community because, like I said, it's a hub. It's a place that so many good players drive straight past to get to another club. So making it better so that they don't have to, so that they can make that their home is great. Um, my interaction with the women's side of the club has been minimal. Um, I follow their results. Uh, I've had a chat with their coach. Um, it would be nice to have more integration between the women's and and men's teams, but knowing that they've just made their way up to WNPL, I'm sure they got a lot on their plate. Um, it's it's a tough gig to get mm. to go from state league to NPL. So. Um, I hope they do well. I'll be out to watch some games. Um, it's a shame they can't play at our ground. They're having to play all yep. their games at Velo. Um, but, you know, it's it's a tough gig and, and I'm sure they'll, um, they'll they'll give a good account of themselves. Absolutely. And it's good to have that, those clubs that have uh, be able to offer both a men 
and a women's uh, team to the community as well. So mm. we're seeing a lot like that happening uh, in South Australia, which is fantastic. Um, the supporters and the and the um, volunteers and the, also the sponsors of the club, how have they been to you since your inclusion at the club? No, oh, great. Yeah, um, sponsors, no, not sponsors, sorry, volunteers, they're very difficult to find. Mm. Um, every club will find that. So if you can find good volunteers who are willing to, to do things for the club, then, you know, it's, they're, they're like gold. Um, and we've got some really good volunteers at the club. Um, sponsors, I haven't had a great deal to do with the spon- some of the sponsors. You know, we see them for, after a drink, for a drink after a game. Um, and, you know, they're all great. Um, supporters will always tell me their, their opinions, for better or worse. <laughs> Um, you know, and I, sometimes you just have to accept them. Other times I, well, don't really care. Most, <laughs> yeah. most of the time I don't really care what they think, but I'll certainly give them an ear yep. if, you know, we've had a, a, a performance that, that warrants it. But at the end of the day, like we, we are a work in process. I am a work in process as a coach. So process, progress, work in um, progress. Work in progress. Um, so, you know, I know people want results. That's why they support teams. Yeah. But I've been a Carlton supporter for 30 years and I've only ever seen one grand final. So. Yeah. Mm. I've been an LA United supporter for so long. I only saw them win one grand final. So I know what it's like. It's, it's, it's difficult as a, as a fan, but it's much more difficult as a coach because you're there, you're trying to get those results. And it's hard when you, depending on what position you're put in and uh, the circumstances having happening outside of the pitch as well with obviously COVID as well and stuff like that. So it's always hard to put to be in that, in that space. But having those volunteers there is a huge um, building ground for a lot of clubs. And it's good to see that you guys have a lot of uh, a great ones there to help you guys get through. Yeah. And and as we progress and as we get bigger, hopefully we'll get more and, mm. and, and that's how it goes. Yeah. Absolutely, mate. I've enjoyed chatting to you. You've had a, a, a huge career, 20 years in the, in the local leagues, FFA Cup, championships, cups, uh, local cups, um, best and fairest. And you've, you shared a lot of that with me tonight, and um, I, I loved uh, hearing the stories, especially about your uh, your entries as well. And they're not, I'm not going to forget them just as much as uh, you won't forget them either. But uh, before we let you go, we're going to do the uh, the final half of the kicking it questions. And uh, who would you like to kick it with on a Saturday night watching some footy? Ah, oh, the missus. The missus. Yeah. She wouldn't watch the footy, but if she was there, that'd be right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. That's yeah. a, something different. Anyone international as well? Um, oh, Pat McAfee. So Pat McAfee and your um, and yep. your missus. Yeah. Perfect. That's like a good Saturday night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be quiet one if we could shut him up. Yeah. Yep. Nice, <laughs> mate. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your your t- generous time to uh, to come out and uh, chat to me over two parts and share your thoughts on the game as well. It's been an eye opener. For, um, for myself and to see what you've gone through in your career. And uh, hopefully you can crack the uh, 500 in a few years' time. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, thank you so much and uh, all the best. My pleasure. Thank you. That was uh, Jonathan Negus from Modbury Vista. Make sure you subscribe to Kicking It Local wherever you get your podcast so you can get a taste of the SA football community. Plus, follow at Kicking It Local SA on Instagram and Twitter so you don't miss any of the action. See you soon.